Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, so my talk is about managing shrivel in stone fruit. Um, just the content of the talk is a quick introduction. Then I'm going with uh, talking about moisture loss and its principles. And then we're going through the whole from pre-harvest, harvest, harvest uh, field removal, from pick to pack, packaging, alternative packaging, and relative humidity in cold rooms. So just a quick introduction is we all know shovel is a problem on certain stone fruit cultivars and kinds, and, uh, and that is uh, cold stored um, for export markets. And the control of, of shovel and fruit is a serious challenge. Like we all know, it's not very easy. And there's a pressure from the consumers and the governments, like Daniel said, um, for the use of single-use plastics and also to make them more recyclable. So I'm going to talk now about some moisture loss and some principles of that. So the symptoms of um, shrivel is excessive moisture loss that manifests as shrivel in, in plums and, um, and nectarines, and then shrivel or wilting in apricots. And there you can see a, a nice picture of some unwanted shrivel. And it's often accompanied by the reduction in circumference of the fruit and also fruit weight that is resulted in that. So one of the principles is that water always flow from a high to a low concentration. So if you look at that diagram, your fruit is your 100%, your environment, uh, your orchard, your um, pack house, your cold room is the, the environment that's less than 100% humidity. So there's always a net flow from your fruit outwards, and that's not ideal. So if we look at um, moisture loss um, from a product of the function of the vapor pressure, pre vapor, uh, vapor pressure deficit, and then you'll see that it's, there's a few functions. There's forces that encourage the movement of water out of the fruit. And there we look at environmental factors. Um, that is high temperatures that will um, improve mo movement, uh, low humidity, and that's, in, like I said, in the orchards, cold stores, shipping containers and also the skin properties of your fruit. And that can be cracks, lint to cell openings, and injuries. And then you also get forces that resist the, the movement of water. And there you will have your product types. So apricots, nectarines, peaches, and plums, they differ um, with susceptibility to shrivel. Um, also different cultivars uh, are more susceptible to others, and that's due to skin properties. And obviously maturity also plays a role. That's your wax layer that's on your, on your skin of your fruit. And also packaging that we can use to limit those movements. So if we look at work that Mariani used to do in 2006 uh, on vapor pressure deficit in the handling chain, you can see there's a quite a few areas that of concern that, we, that everyone have to look at. So obviously when you have your um, harvested fruit in a bin, with outer liner, you'll see the vapor pressure deficit is on the high side. Then when they um, place the wet blanket on the fruit, um, it reduced by almost more than half. Um, then the fruit was uh, in a shed waiting for transport to the pack house. Um, then obviously transport uh, to the pack house and waiting. Um, packaging in the, in the shade, then it was quite high again. Maybe the blanket dried out already. And um, then in the pack house itself, it's a little bit lower because it's out of the sun, out of the, the heat, of the extreme heat. Um, so it's much lower. And then once the forced air cooling starts, it, it spikes again. Um, and we'll later, I'll, I'll talk about that. And as soon as the fruit um, reaches its target temperature at the end of the forced air cooling, it's at the minimum again. And that's where you actually want your fruit as soon as possible. So, so the ideal is to get from, from the left-hand side to the right-hand side as quick as possible so that you can limit your moisture loss through the system. So now we're going to look at the pre-harvest and harvest areas. Um, Pre-harvest, you want to have optimal soil and groundwater status in your, in your, in your orchards. Um, that is to reduce stress on your, on, your, on your trees. And that can be also a drought stress or a overwatering stress is not ideal as well. 
but the, in that photo you can see clearly that was fruit that was stressed in the orchard due to water stress and the tree um, absorbed water out of the, the fruit and you don't see it at harvest but after cold storage you'll have shunk, uh, sunken shoulders as well as internal browning that develops due to that withdrawn of moisture from the fruit. Um, if we look at harvest um, maturity parameters, you have to harvest at optimum maturity. Your greener fruit has got, in most cases, a thinner wax layer, your riper fruit, got cracks maybe in the wax layer, and that influences the storability and eating quality of your fruit. So it's ideal to uh, harvest at optimum maturity. And also the pickers and the, the handling of the fruit must be that you prevent bruising and abrasions of the product because that all creates opening for moisture loss and obviously we all know decay can also be an issue with every wound that you make. Um, harvesting of fruit should be done in cool hours of the day. Um, we, we obviously advise people to do it early morning and under 30 degrees Celsius, but we know in, in the practice it's not uh, practical or it can't be done. But if you can't do that, just make sure that you um, reduce the field heat as soon as possible. That's very important. You want to avoid direct sunlight in your bins, so you have to cover your bins maybe with, um, if you do the old school wet blankets, make sure it's, it's cleaned with chlorine water. Um, that space blankets and all those different types that you can cover your bins or just park them in the shade out of the direct sunlight um, because yesterday uh, I spoke about the effect of heat damage and direct sunlight on fruit so that's very important to reduce that as far as you can um, to limit internal disorders as well and shrivel. And you want to reduce your fruit uh, temperature as soon as possible because you want to slow down the respiration rate of your fruit and that's obviously also do with over ripeness and with shrivel and then also to do that you need field heat removal. So what is, why is it important to do that? It's obviously to limit moisture loss, you want to maintain the quality of your fruit, you spend a few months to get good quality fruit and you, you can mess it up in an hour or two so you have to maintain that and obviously to prevent the over ripeness of your fruit. So in Stanford, we've got a few handling options with that regard. Option one is always to pack the stone fruit on the same day that you harvest. That's ideal, if you can. Um, there you obviously, uh, a cold room for field heat removal is not necessary. Um, if you have one, you can use one, but otherwise you can just leave it in the shade for a, uh, a few hours before you pack it, just to get that field heat out. Then your option two, and that's mainly only we use for, for plums. I, I don't know if somebody uses it for, for other um, commodities as well. But, but if you pack it in, in one or two days after harvest, um, maybe after a weekend, um, you want to store it in a cold room at 12 to 15 degrees Celsius, and that should be above dew point. And that's done for two reasons. You want to pre prevent condensation of your fruit, um, and that obviously can promote decay. And um, cold temperatures can trigger ripening, um, so that's ideal to, to keep your quality of your fruit. And then you can pack as soon as possible, as, uh, so you don't have to wait for the fruit to reach any target temperatures. Just make sure that you, you pack it as soon as you, you have space in your pack lines. And then the, the last option, and that they don't do a lot, but you can, um, if you cannot pack in two days uh, or over a weekend, you can cool the fruit at minus 0.5 in bins. Um, you must just make sure that you pack them loosely so that there's adequate uh, circulation of air through the bins, or some people can also use forced air cooling just to get that um, center of the bin cool down because we know at static temperatures it can take up to five days for the center of the bin to reach the, the temperature. And obviously it's got advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages you want to prevent the over ripeness um, and the disadvantage you will definitely pack wet fruit um, and obviously you've got a risk of decay and then there's a negative effect of internal quality due to the break in the cold chain. Um, we did some work on Angelino plums that we stored for six weeks in, in bins 
Then we did another additional three weeks where the fruit was packed after that six weeks into cartons um, with the uh, 54 by 2 millimeter gray bag. Um, it was similar to for three weeks and a shelf life. And we can clearly see the effect of the humidity control that we, because we tested it in two, two cold rooms. One was a bin room that where the fruit was, uh, the room was closed for the entire six weeks um, with wet floors. The other room were uh, a, low, a, a low humidity room that we stored a similar amount of fruit in. And then we packed it and we stored it in the same room. And you can clearly see the difference in shrivel just with that humidity control that was done in, in, in the bin room on the effect on the, the quality of the fruit arriving on the other side. So it's very important to manage your relative humidity. Um, and one of the things is to uh, have your relative humidity around 90 to 95. I don't know, that's, that's not very easily done, but you need to aim at least for, for that, for, uh, and that's adequate for fruit storage. Um, because you want to reduce the relative humidity difference between your fruit and the environment, that's your cold room. And then there's other ways of limiting that, and that is packaging, as well as the increase of that, um, the relative humidity in your, in your cold rooms. So packing maturity is therefore one, one of the main reasons to protect the fruit from, from moisture loss and shrivel. Um, the fruit in the packaging are fruit kind and cultivars are specific, so some of them we recommend a, a liner like this one, a shovel sheet or a wrapper. It's 800 by, 15 meet, 800 by 500 millimeters in size. It's got 54 by 6 mil perforations and they use it for plums and nectarines. You can see it on the picture, it's just folded um, around the fruit, so it's actually open on the sides but it's obviously covered with the box, so it's nice to tuck it in, um, like we would do tuck in your, uh, your, your sheets in your bed, just to tuck it in nicely. One thing I have seen a lot lately, and it's not from, because I source a lot of fruit from commercial pack houses, and um, if you open the, the box, you'll see a, like a gaping hole in that middle area, or on the side where the, 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 the uh, sheet is not placed incorrectly, or it's way off to the one side, so this whole side is open, and then you waste your money by placing shovel sheets in, and obviously you'll have um, high shovel levels on the other side. The other um, packaging that we use is a 54 by 2 mil perforated bag. Um, that's more plum specific. I know um, we just use it mainly on Angelinos and African Delights, but I've heard this season that a lot of people are moving towards that because of the high shrivel levels. Um, we definitely have to, to look at that. Um, we also did a, a, a trial um, that we tested, uh, no liners, um, the, the standard, the shrivel sheet or the bag versus the 36 by 4 mil uh, bag. And we also tested some alternative um, paper liners um, like this one. Um, this was the best alternative to, to plastics if we had to go away from plastics. This was a pair of perforated uh, liner as well, the same perforations as that um, wrapper or shovel sheet. Um, we also tested some edible coatings in the past. There was some issues on Ruby Sun and African Alight with uh, skin pitting, um, but it worked well on some of the other varieties. Um, um, like Tiffany and um, Angelinos, it worked well on. So it's definitely coatings will maybe also be very cultivar specific. Um, and then obviously we also tested some combinations uh, that also worked well. Um, and then obviously combination with plastics. So if we look at relative humidity in cold rooms, um, the aim is to get your relative humidity in cold rooms between that sweet spot of 90 to 95. We did a survey on commercial cold rooms in Robertson, Cirrus, and um, the Stellenbosch and Mondium Peril area. Um, we looked at a few uh, pre-packed bin rooms. Um, 
from those seven rooms, five of them were in the 85 to 90 percent range. One room was in the high 90s, uh, high 80s, low 90s, and one room was at uh, below 82 percent. If you look at forced air cooling, and this is a dedicated forced air cooling rooms, um, we looked at um, four rooms in total, uh, and there were 30, uh, 23 runs done in that period that we assessed it. Of those 23, three of them were done in a poor range, and that's below 80%. So uh, the, the moisture of moisture loss that would happen there would be uh, very high. Then only three rooms of three of those runs were done when the relative humidity was above 90%, and that's what you actually want. And then the 17, the balance was between 80 and 90, they're in the middle, middle range. So that's, that three rooms were good, but the rest aren't good at all for forced equilibrium, because if you can remember when I showed you that VP, um, vapor pressure deficit graph, your spike is when you do forced equilibrium. So that's a very, um, it's an area that we have to look at to increase the relative humidity. Um, we also looked at two rooms that were used for forced air cooling, um, and they were also not very good. One was like in a medium range at 84, and one was poor at 79% humidity. And then we looked at a bunch of accumulation rooms, and five of them were between the 85 and 90%, while the rest was all below 85% to in the low, uh, high 70s. So that is also not very good for, for moisture loss and shrivel. And most of the culgums, I, I would say 99% of them didn't monitor their relative humidity in their rooms that I assessed. And also they didn't have alternative or extra temperature loggers in their, in their rooms to, to monitor the temperature. They only relied on the, the um, cold rooms return air um, uh, probe. So forced equilling um, must be done on peaches and nectarines and apricots. They can go a little bit faster between 12 and 24 hours at minus 0 0.5. Um, uh, cooling, forced equilling of plums must be done not shorter than 24 hours, but ideal at 48 hours. Uh, and why I said not too rapidly, because in, in work we've done on heat damage, we, could, we saw that if you've uh, forced air cool too fast, you can actually worsen the effect of um, uh, internal browning um, that was due to exposure of the fruit uh, to heat, heat wave prior to, to harvest. So it's very important not to harvest, to, uh, yeah, to cool too rapidly because you can make things worse. Um, on the other side of that, um, we also saw that if you go longer than 48 hours, then you go into the shovel side again. So I think 48 hours is your, if you, is, is roughly a sweet spot between internal disorders and shovel. But if you can up your relative humidity, then you'll win on the shovel side and you will win on the internal disorder side. So, like I said, forced equaling may lead to an increase in moisture loss and shovel. Um, so that's very important to switch off your uh, forced air cooling fans when the product reaches your target temperature. Don't let it run forever. Um, it's because you're re reducing the air movement, um, you will reduce obviously the, the, that boundary layer. Um, because every, all fruit's got a, a saturated boundary layer of moisture around the fruit. And if you keep on taking it away with air movement, you'll dry out the fruit very fast. So just a quick summary, um, stone fruit is a very high perishable product, so that's important that all the steps that I mentioned now, that you take care of that, uh, make sure that it happens. Um, and obviously there's, very sim uh, there's a few similarities between stone fruit kinds and cultivars, but there's also big differences between them. So you can't, there's no one shoe fits all, so you must make sure that you know um, the maturity of your fruit that you have, so that you can um, take the necessary steps to make sure that you, the quality that you start off with, you can maintain through the whole chain and deliver it on the other side in a good condition. And it's all about attention to detail because that's the difference between success and failure. Thank you very much.